Good afternoon in New York. Good evening and night in Ukraine and in Europe, Africa and Israel. And welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining our webinar today. This International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, Commemorative Solidarity Psychohistorical, first of a three-part series webinar is held in collaboration with the Department of Medical Psychology, Psychosomatic Medicine and Psychotherapy, Bogomolets National Medical University in Kiev, towards the anniversary of the invasion of 24 February 2022. The hundreds of registrants to today's webinar from around 20 countries attest both to the timely urgency of this event and to the pivotal importance of the perspectives and issues it would illuminate. This webinar would not have happened if it weren't for the professionalism and generosity of Professor Irina Frankova of Bogomolets University, among other capacities, not the least of which is she's a member of the Advisory Council of the ICMGLT, and Dr. Natasha Dorova Kroll of the ARC organization in the Netherlands. To fully understand the traumatogenic experiences of the present, this war and its concomitant large-scale humanitarian crises must be viewed from the perspective of the countless losses and mass human rights violations that have brutally revisited upon Ukraine throughout the 20th century such as World War I, World War II, famines, Holodomor, Holocaust, Stalinist repressions, Chernobyl. Multidisciplinary experts will examine the cumulative effects of these and earlier historical devastating events and collective traumata during those and of the Soviet era and their impact on succeeding generations. Your moderator, that is me, I'm a clinical psychologist, victimologist and traumatologist, de dedicated much of my career to the studying, treating and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights, into reparative justice. Our first presenter, Metropolitan Boris Gudjak, current Archbishop of the Ukrainian Catholic Archipelago of Philadelphia in the United States, founded the Institute of Church History and was a rector of the U Ukrainian Catholic University, where he now serves as its president. Gujak is a historian, theologian, and educator who authored and edited several books on church history, theology, modern church life, and higher education reforms. Because he cannot be in several places at once, he generously pre-recorded a video for our event. Our hearts are with Professor Yaroslav Hitzak, who lost his mother two days ago and cannot be with us today. We are most gladly joined by Dr. Boris Herzovsky, a poet, 
an essayist, member of Penn Ukraine, psychologist, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and rector of the Kiev Institute of Modern Psychology and Psychotherapy from Odessa, Ukraine, in the Soviet, from Odessa, Ukraine. In the Soviet times, Dr. Hesonsky was part of the Shamich movement, which disseminated alternative nonconformist literature through unofficial channels. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, he published 17 collections of poetry and essays in Russian, and most recently in Ukrainian. This is one of my favorite because I can read it in English. Boris will be followed by Dr. Oresto Suvalo. Suvalo, a psychiatrist coordinator of community-based mental health services development at the Mental Health for Ukraine project, coordinator of projects at Institute of Mental Health of Ukrainian Catholic University, and co-chair of the Lviv region local mental health PSS group. Last but not least, is specialist of trauma-focused psychotherapy and crisis counseling, Hanna Mokrusova. Hanna is co-founder and psychologist of the Bluebird non-governmental organization, which provides psychological, legal, and humanitarian support to people who survived captivity, their family members, and to families of the missing. We have an hour and a half for the webinar. Each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your questions to a particular panelist or to the full panel. The screen is now open to Metropolitan Boris Guchak video. Trauma is a scar. It always leaves a trace. It can bend and break. It can pervert, distort. But it can also be overcome. It can be transfigured spiritually, morally, psychologically. This transfiguration can even ennoble. We are often unconscious about the fact that the trace and scars of slaughter's trauma really do endure. 35 years ago as a doctoral student in Kyiv, entering those elaborate uh, Soviet era metros, I was hit by the gate. To this day, every time I come into the Kyiv metro, I'm afraid of that gate. Like a person who's been bit by a dog. This trauma can be manipulated. Maybe you remember the incident when President Putin brought in a dog into a meeting with Angela Merkel, who is afraid of dogs because she was probably traumatized by a canine. And he would glee, saw, uh, the most powerful woman in the world retract. These are benign examples, simple, marginal, not, not lethal in any manner. What is being experienced by an entire nation that has, has been traumatized for a century? In the 20th, with probably 15 million 
murders, violent deaths, deaths uh, that were not natural, two world wars, famines, an artificial famine, the whole of the Mor, the Holocaust, from generation to generation, and what was a systemic application of terror. A nation has had the trauma placed almost in its DNA. And now this nine year war with a one year full scale invasion. I've returned from Ukraine hours ago and I've been there six times since February, 2022. It is amazing how people endure. It is inspiring to the world how people resist, but the trauma is there. The country is in a perpetual state of mourning, daily funerals. A military chaplaincy in view has two soldiers one day, four soldiers the next day. The entire families, the community, that comes together to mourn the killing of beautiful young people. They're gone. As are the legs, the limbs, the arms, the eyes. So many paralyzed, so many orphans, so many widows and widowers. The trauma will be there for generations. History shows Ukrainians that trauma is transgenerational. The torture, I spoke with Taira, Yulia Payevska held for three, three months. A medic who saved the lives of many Russian soldiers was tortured for three months by the Russian occupiers. It is so important for us to focus on the trauma with a view towards its transfiguration. Even the resurrected Christ bore the wounds. The wounds stay, the scars persist. But the human spirit can see through if it is helped with love and solidarity. The fear that remains can be overcome by communion, by fellowship, by gentle touch, by understanding silence, by patient, profound listening. The Lord is with us. We Christians believe in a God that took on the most excruciating pain and trauma. And he was transfigured. He shone forth with light and life. Light and life is our vocation. Freedom and justice. This experience is bringing before the world the deep nature of transgenerational trauma, something that I grew up with, but something that my parents overcame. They gave me life and we're called to help millions live in light, confidence, be free of fear and give life. Trauma is a scar. I now give the floor to Dr. Boris Khersonsky. Boris, the screen is yours. Good morning to everybody 
who is in the United States of America. Good evening to everybody who is now in Europe, who is in Ukraine. I see that there are also people from China. Uh, they hear us now. And I cannot tell for sure what time it is the, uh, now, but, and what is the internet greeting? Good time of the day to you. May any time of the day, every time of the day, be the good one for each one of us. I would like to begin my speech with a metaphor. In the Catholic uh, Mass, there is a prayer, uh, a holy rosary. And in the Ukrainian um, tradition, there is a rosary and there's verbitsa. And these are beads that one needs to um, hold in the hands, or these are knots that are on a, a rope. And this helps remember certain events uh, that occurred in the course of history, biblical kiss history, uh, history of the New Testament. In the classical rosary, there are four types of these uh, memories that are mandatory. The first ones are called the joyful ones. The other ones are called light ones. The light memories uh, were introduced by the um, Pope John um, Paul II. And there are also memories that are mournful and sad. So each one of us has our own personal rope, our line of beads, our memories that we uh, need to remember often and need to remember for sure. And I would say that there is such a thing as a national memory, which is connected with our citizenship, with our cultural tradition. And if I start speaking of these type of memories for Ukraine, for Ukrainian tradition, then I could say that our rope of no, knots, our rosary is quite sad. We remember many horrific and sad events, and often we remember them, we come, they come to our mind. And the same thing with the historical trauma and historical memory. Unfortunately, the recent, um, the light events in our history don't come very often. I would say, um, I am not exactly a psychoanalytic, but this is a counter to the psychoanalytic history that says that the sad memories are pushed away. It is not often that we remember something joyful that happened in our life. And this is a long-standing tradition, perhaps because uh, we have had so many events about which we have already heard. These are the traumas um, upon the revolution, the Stalinist terror traumas. For Ukrainian uh, nation, this is the Holodomor trauma. For the Jews, this is the Holocaust trauma. And these two traumas have carried away with them almost equal number of people. And they were horrific and cruel. We have gained our independence just recently. In the historic context, we are a very young state. And at the same time, we're a very ancient state. In the Ukrainian tradition, we can find a certain way of fixation upon a trauma. Many uh, folk songs, especially the ones who are connected to the Kozak fate, they're sad. There is this topic of uh, defeat, um, exile, uh, death. And these are the topics for the uh, poets in the past. For example, Shevchenko has a poem uh, about the defeat at the city of Berestechko. 
Why are you black, O oh green field? Around the town of Berestechko, four miles around, the um, honorable Cossacks have uh, covered me with their carcasses. Um, how many feedbacks we received when the heavenly hunter died. And indeed, Ukraine has seen all too many traumatic events like this. And the topic of the um, suffering of a hero, suffering of Ukraine is one of the most loud, outspoken. Again, Shevchenko, who writes that, I, I don't care whether I live in Ukraine or not. I do not care whether I am remembered or I am forgotten, but I do care where, if Ukraine would be lulled to sleep by evil people and would be robbed in the, um, in the flames. Oh, I do care about that. And in that poem, the poet Shevchenko equals metaphorically uh, the country and the woman that was lulled to sleep, that was raped, that was robbed, and then awakened. And this quintessence uh, of uh, difficult historical fate is reflected in this poem. Upon the events in Maidan, the most popular um, song was um, Lemkivka song, uh, where uh, dying in exile is the key topic. So in our collective rosary, there we are missing uh, light and joyful events. There's a phenomenon of accumulation of traumatic experience. Does that influ influence the collective conscious? Does indeed a hero who suffers and died is the main archetype of the collective of uh, subconscious of our nation, but all the archetype are, are ambivalent and hero archety uh, archetype contains he uh, victory and sometimes heroes flip to the opposite. I um, can compare the archetype with a um, floater half uh, red half white today the floater has flipped and today we see a very different psychological picture the striving for victory has overlapped overcome the sad um, memories it's another uh, song which became the net the folk um, anthem of the people this is about vervain and, and the um, um, growing in the field it's about bringing joy to the sad Ukraine, to um, free uh, the brothers Ukrainians from the Moscovite uh, chains. The decisive factor is the uh, presence of the independent Ukrainian state that requires, um, that doesn't require protection. The Russian failed to notice that over the last 30 years, a new generation came up, which wasn't loaded, um, apart from all of the propaganda efforts and Ukrainian propaganda is accentuating um, suffering, Holodomor, Holocaust, uh, the defeat uh, in the course of history of Ukraine. And in spite of that propaganda, these people are not overloaded with the negative historical experience. This is a generation that was singing different songs at the um, scouting uh, fire uh, bonfires and around the uh, celebratory banquets. And this phenomenon reminds me the radical change of the Jewish um, thinking after the uh, establishment of the Israeli state. In other words, the people who used to be victims for thousands of years, they finally gained the very land, the very territory that is worth protecting and which is for them the promised land. And when Ukraine has gained its independence, it also gained its promised land, the land that is its dear one, the one that is worth protecting. And unfortunately, there are the ones to protect it from. So we have, we're dealing here with a powerful enemy, which I am sure 
of Russia is being guided by unhealthy soulful person with pathological um, personality disorder who doesn't have good contact with reality and is unable to uh, make um, good decision and this stubbornness and um, narcissism is typical for the person and here's what I want to say now we're going through a very traumatic experience and it has and it pertains also to uh, intergenerational problems because the people whose experience is connected with the Soviet Union who have memories about so the Soviet U Union with the positive who cannot see the enemy in Russia they also live among us and our families are divided and inter-understanding is not always found. Brothers and sisters, they now are sometimes in enmity to each other. The older generation looks down at the uh, events very different than the young people who don't have the traumatic experience in their past. And now this war is the first serious challenge for them, a test. And again, I want to compare the fate of Ukrainian and Jewish peoples. And this is the challenge for the diaspora. Ukrainian people has a large diaspora. And we have heard the Metropolitan um, uh, Boris Hudzak, who is now in charge of Philadelphia higher um, hierarchy and before that he was uh, uh, in charge in Bel uh, France and Belgium Belgium uh, the uh, hierarchy of um, the Ukrainians and in the USA in Chicago not only in Philadelphia and Canada we know that it is a large territory which um, rooms many Ukrainians so this event that which now is occurring it is leading to the the fact that both those who are outside of ukraine have gained the land that they can take care of the same way that jewish diaspora is taking care of the territory of the israel state and I'm not sure who is taking care more of diaspora of, about Israeli state or the Israeli state about its diaspora. But the point is that this land is there. It continuously is under threat of destruction. And this ensures unity of the people. And the paradoxically, the paradox that I want to highlight, it lies in the fact that the very thing that was supposed to deepen the historical trauma, it is reducing the trauma. Despite the murders, despite all of those acts that Russia has committed in Bucha, in Irpin, in other towns, besides a in spite of all of that, the unity is strengthening and the support that we are experiencing, it helps us to so many with whom I work as a therapist to um, move this negative experience away and to look forward and not look back. Now, I shouldn't be saying the name of the rabbi who said that uh, a human being is um, very strange because uh, they have it has the human has e uh, eyes in the back the looking back on what it knows but it doesn't want to look forward on what is in front of the person so now we have uh, turned around we don't look back as much we're looking forward and the word victory it is like a, a healing uh, medicine. 
it helps us go through these horrible times. This is what I wanted to offer to you. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Boris. Actually, thank you both Borises <laughs> for the compassion and the inspiration and the optimism in the midst of such a brutal situation and loss. And to give the historical analysis that is even more global. Uh, it is true, this is not, it, the war is in Ukraine, but the, the, I think the world feels like it's the world. Ukraine is absolutely not alone. Orest, uh, please, the floor is yours. Good day, good time of the day. I will be speaking English. Do you hear me? Do you hear me now? Thank you. I will be speaking English because we have a lot of international guests. Arrest, arrest, you are muted. You Elena? are muted. No, yeah, uh, we can hear Orest in English channel. Uh, have oh, you oh, chosen you. the thank language? You. Okay, if other people made my mistake, you can hear him on the English channel. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. It's a big honor for me to be here among such respectful participants. And before I start speaking, I want to thank the Armed Forces of Ukraine for the fact that they have possibility to be here with you and to have possibility to share my thoughts and my experience. And I, I also want to thank international community for supporting Ukraine, which now is defending its right for existence and its identity. I especially want to thank you, Dr. Yael Daniele and Irena Frankova for invitation. During my brief talk, I would like to say about Ukraine and maybe in superficial about mental health in Ukraine in context of the past, present and future. And it's quite difficult challenge to, to, to try to do this in 10 minutes. And we know from the public mental health perspective that war, disasters, emergencies, violence, this is like huge social predictors to mental health disorders. And we understand influence of these states to the mental health, not only for the person, but also for generations. And when we are looking through this spectrum to the past 20th century, as already Boris Hersonsky and uh, Boris Hudziak told, the 20th century was very traumatizing for Ukrainian population, for different nations who live it here. And also, this is story of resistance and of resilience. But unfortunately, we did not have possibility to learn from this experience, because during Soviet era, a lot of information, a lot of uh, witnesses, they were prohibited or hidden in archives, and it was not possible to develop knowledge to make researches and to, to build some evidences related to these difficult times. There are a few modern English language books about Ukrainian history, and I would recommend you to learn about this time. And this is Timothy Schneider, you know, Blood Events, or uh, Serhii Pluhi, Gate to Europe. And uh, when, for example, we are looking at the last book of Yaroslav Hrzak, who unfortunately is not with us today, his last book, Overcoming the Past, A Global History of Ukraine, he highlighted a whole chapter dedicated to violence, to violence in this, in this events 
and understanding and reading about this, we more deeply understand the influence to our generations, to our mental health due to, to this, uh, to this events. And uh, after gaining the independence, independence in 1991, Ukraine slowly, step by step, began to uh, investigate the past. And we know the story, how information about Holodomor appeared, how our colleagues from UK helped us better understand and share the information about Holodomor at the, at the world. And also we have <laughs> researches about Holodomor in Ukraine and archives began uh, to be opened and investigators has had a lot of chance to begin some collected uh, co collection of data about uh, about this uh, this events in 20th century and uh, when just talking about the past finishing this part of my speech recently i found somewhere in internet the letter from a father to his son from the city brode it's not far from Lviv, uh, the city where Josef Roth was born. He's a Jewish writer in Austrian Hungary um, Empire. And father is writing letter to his son about Russian forces who were at this time, 1914, 1915, in, in, this, in this area. And they ran away to the east because front uh, approached to the, to the east and they, the forces, the soldiers, they stole apples, food, and cattle. So this is a lot of similarities that we see now, and the same approaches, the same school, the same attitude toward Ukrainians, toward people who are living here. And also father mentioned that Russian soldiers didn't accept Ukrainians as a separate nation. They came to protect them. And now, when we are living now already in an independent country, and we also had not easy times during our short independence in terms of world vision, we had two revolutions, Orange Revolution in 2004 and the Revolution of Dignity, which showed us the big force of civil society, the growth of civil society try it to protect state and country from the mistakes that government at this time wanted to do. And in my opinion, we were successful in this. And this is the proud story of our history. Nevertheless, that we have also a lot of lost there and grief there. But after revolution of dignity, Russian occupied Crimea, occupied the eastern part of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk region. And uh, nevertheless, of the war that began in 2014, Ukraine tried to develop. We had some reforms in the different parts of state, uh, state policy, the police reform, decentralization, healthcare reform. It was not idea, ideally, not easy with some mistakes and also some troubles. But when Ukraine was especially vulnerable, Russian made a full state, full scale invasion last year. And the last year, during this year, we are living in new reality because during a few days, Ukraine for the developmental context shifted to the humanitarian context. And now all country is in humanitarian context with all related uh, to these consequences and uh, for people and also for, for the state. And uh, now during this year, we see from different informational sources, the violence that Russians are doing all around Ukraine, especially in this part, which was uh, which were occupied by them. 
and all sphere of our life are influenced by uh, by Russians at its everyday massive missiles attacks, drone attacks, and uh, healthcare needs needs of IDPs, and there are a lot of urgent challenges and urgent needs. But from other side, what I see during this year, working in MHPSS activities in working with stakeholders, with uh, IDPs, with other actors here in uh, uh, in mental health field, I see also the growing resilience and growing cooperation, coordination around topic of war and mental health during the war. And I see people who were evacuated from eastern part or central part of Ukraine to, to the west. And during this year, they trained a lot. They began became a very high specialized professionals who are providing services. And what I see now and what is related to our future, this, this war is also possibility to think how to rebuild country after victory and how to build or renew the especially mental health system because according to the WHO uh, we know about consequences that and probably they will be here for years and already now we should think how to rebuild mental health system healthcare system and what principles should be in the basis of of this process and now during this year i see the big possibilities to promote and make a good practices working with trauma related issues which also is a like consequence to the good cooperation and coordination among the actors as we have recommendation from humanitarian actors all around the world but also the topic of mental health the interest is increasing and we have now we can possibility to see how top level politicians are promoting this issue and this is good possibility also to to look for resources to look for people to create and establish the new evidence-based human rights oriented practices which could be served not only by specialists but also to promote service provision about non-specialized services which could provide high not high intensive uh, intensive uh, intervention but low intensive intervention and we will have possibility to cover more people with support peer support with uh, a network building and promote develop services among communities and i think that this process should be based on the values and principles according to the human rights uh, oriented approaches, recovery oriented approaches, and, and also trauma informed approaches. And I think when we will promote more this, uh, this issues, uh, we will much more better overcome the consequences and increase our resilience in rebuilding Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Oris, so much. Uh, even though we are not in the dialogue part yet, uh, you're reminding me of our work in, uh, in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, where the, the, uh, the name uh, my colleagues chose for our project was Democracy cannot be built with the hands of broken souls. And the reason I love this expression so much 
is that it ties in the mental health consideration with human rights, with the global need of the society, not just individuals, uh, you know, individuals here and there. And indeed, uh, public health is extremely important. And as I told you in our rehearsal time, <laughs> I believe uh, Madame Zelensky should take on the leadership uh, of this uh, important initiative. But who am I to say that? <laughs> dear, dear Hannah, please join us. I can say that for me, this war in generally, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war started in 2014. I used to live in the city of Luhansk and my city was one of the first to be occupied by people who didn't wear a, a Russian coat of arms but called themselves Russian soldiers. And perhaps back then in the 2014, I personally, uh, encountered first the thing that, you know, whatever they taught us that we're one nation. And I grew up in the Lugansk region and they taught us that this is brotherhood nation. And then back in 2014, these people who came to occupy my city, they uh, held me back personally. And I saw hatred in their eyes. I saw a young guy pointing a machine gun at me and he said that he hates me just because I'm a Ukrainian and probably back then is what it was to me what happens to the entire Ukraine now this was that separation where you clearly understand that despite that even though the border is in fact very close but you are very different and you definitely have nothing in common this was my personal first perception of that indeed. This is unlike, we are not kin of kin, we're very different peoples. And since that, having been evacuated, I am busy um, helping assistance, giving assistance to people who were um, captured, who were tortured, and I'm supporting the people who, uh, um, who, the families whose people got missing. And now we see what the Russians do. But back then, only a precious few were involved in this issue. And for me, a person who grew up in Ukraine, who regardless, although we have this uh, Soviet uh, past, Ukraine was never like Russia, nevertheless, we had this uh, feeling of personal dignity the perception that our life is worth something and that therefore it was personally a shock for me what the Russians did on then occupied territories because back from 2014 it is a method of the way Russians wage war when they occupied new territories they try to break the nation they take captives, not only military personnel, because this is a fallible thought for um, um, many people think that um, captivity is um, prisoners of war when the military uh, capture military, but no, Russians, they wage war to obliterate nation, nation. That's why they take civilians, all who fight, all who speak Ukrainians, or who think Ukrainians, or whoever face they don't like, one of the methods of waging war for Russians is to intimidate the population. And in principle, they can uh, selectively at random, as they, and they do this in newly occupied territories, they just randomly take people, even not for their patriotism. But, and moreover, there's no gender difference. They take captive men, women, children, and those instances are also there. And indeed, I have been working since 2014. Many people have gone through me, thousands of people, thousands of testimonials who have gone through captivity. And I can't say that I was able to hear either one of those where there was no torture. And that is scary. 
That's terrifying. We understand that indeed, what Russians do, they're trying to break humanity, humaneness. They're trying to change the uh, feeling of dignity. And even what we observe on those liberated territories, there are people who suffered, who were tortured, uh, that caused a horror. And there are some people who say, oh, they were nice, they were polite, they just killed my dog and robbed me. But you understand how perception of normality changes. And that is terrifying. That's what Russians do. They break this perception of normalcy. I don't know how Ukrainian is going to get out of this because indeed I see the feeling, the perception that so many uh, uh, boundaries are blurred. When we speak of um, gender or sexual violence, many people don't understand that if one, a person is forced by people in military uniform to undress, that is uh, sexual violence already. They say, no, no, there was no violence. They just asked me to undress. They just threatened me. They just did that, but they were polite. And that is horrible to hear because the perception of violence is blurred. They are doing that, creating those horrors that on the background of those things that are not normal become normal. Nevertheless, there's an interesting thing that I also observe. observe. I saw hundreds, thousands of people who experienced this. And I saw very few people who would indeed be broken. The Russians, they're experts at torture. They do things that honestly, I have never even read anywhere. I couldn't imagine if the human beings could do this to other human beings. But I see these humans who are have gone through these torture, who get on the other side, get out, and they're unbroken. So I see, I have seen many people, and I don't know where each one of them finds strength, but I see they keep living. It's hard. We work very much. I, there are certain um, cer um, consequences, but these are live people who have overcome terrifying, horrible things, and they find strength to keep living. And for nine years, I have been asking myself a question, where do Ukrainians have strength? This is indeed an incredible experience to see every time people who have survived, who have find so much strength to live. This is an incredible experience that makes me personally, despite all of the things that I hear, to find strength to be um, inspired by all of the people. And now after the full-scale invasion of the war, the world has started looking at some of the uh, atrocities that the Russians are doing, but they're not doing it only to us. The Russians do this everywhere they show up. And for me, as a Ukrainian, what holds me up, which that these crimes are spoken of in all over the world, we're not alone with this anymore. I'm so grateful that there are so many people here who have joined to this webinar who want to hear about Ukraine because again, as a psychologist who has worked with people who are going through loss of dear people, I often see that the people surrounding, first they want to help to those people who are dear ones and they are working with loss, but then they get exhausted. And of course, life goes on and people who are going through a loss, uh, their dear ones don't have any strength. And you know, for me as a Ukrainian, it's really terrifying thought to think, that the world's gonna get tired of us. Our war has been continuing for nine years. The support is very important to us. It is important for us to be part of this world because we're fighting for our liberty, for freedom, for the ability, capacity to freely think and to have this freedom. And we want to be part, we want to see support. And it is scary. You know, it is our war. 
and the rest of the world, how long are we going to have be, to help Ukraine? It is scary that at one point the world will say, well, come on, that's enough. Let them do it on their own. And that is why here I'm really grateful to, for all of the pieces of attention. We don't need that much. We need to be seen. As simple as that, that support, this ability to see us, our stripe. We are coping and we will be fine. But please see us, talk to us, look at us. Don't close your eyes. Thank you. Well, I can definitely promise you that the International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma will not abandon your struggle and we view it as our struggle. Uh, so um, as small as we are, we have, as you see, we have a wide network of caring people who I don't believe we give up at any time. Um, and, um, and thank you for, for speaking <laughs> from your heart, which I'm not surprised about. <laughs> and thank you also for underlying the fact that the torturer compromises his or her dignity and has to live with the effects of that. And that when we speak about gender against gender related violence, every woman has to remember that as well and every man and every child or old person, that the shame is not theirs. It's the torturers, it's the perpetrators. And, and when we think of building a better world together, this is a very important truth to behold. The cost of being brutal against another human being. Um, and indeed, I want to, to thank uh, uh, Marina Rakovic for, <laughs> for being a wonderful voice now. <laughs> And I want to open the next phase of our webinar uh, and please, would you like to comment on each other's presentation? Would you like to add anything to your own presentation? This is the interactive part. And I would appreciate, Boris, you promised to speak English this time, and Oris, please, to make the English speakers feel uh, welcome. <laughs> I mean, the English audience, speaking audience, <laughs> to feel welcome, too. So, uh, please, uh, we can go the other way. Uh, Hannah, would you like to start the second phase? Uh, in, in Ukraine, and, and I'm sure we will have excellent in Ukrainian. Do you have any thoughts about the other, you know, the, 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 the Metropolitan and, and Dr. Hasonsky's and Suvalo presentations that you would like to share? May if not I... now, let Orest you start. And uh, Hannah, take your time. Go ahead, on Orest. I think that Hannah made a very profound and deep speech, and this is real uh, heart 
touching issues and i would like to thank you hannah for 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 what did you say because i also understand that our capacity to work with this problems and with people who have these problems are limited and uh, i'm afraid that we not afraid but i would like and i think that we should to share capacity to work with this type of problems but not all specialists can support this this is also like challenge for for specialists to work in this type of of uh, struggles and uh, i'm afraid that we should make what we can not to keep people be hidden and hidden yeah or forgotten who pass it through or this tortures and this already we discussed it with Yael about this like worldwide movement to uh, to fix all this human rights violations tortures and other crimes and i remember the book from uh, Vladislav Aseyev he is also a journalist from from Luhansk, who was imprisoned by the prison in Luhansk, or I do not remember, in, or Donetsk, in this uh, factory isolation. Yeah, and he described it, and now this book is also translated into English. So I, I strongly recommend you to read about this, because of, in my opinion, in 21th century, such inhuman behavior this is unacceptable and we as a worldwide community and specialists should to, to to do what we can to to overcome this and also to to recognize this in the in the in the human human way yeah to put this in the front of the cart and uh, try to do a lot to predict this. And here also, I remember the speech of Ukrainian Nobel Prize, Prize Alexandra Matvichuk, which is also put a lot of attention to, to, this, uh, to this issue. So Hanna, thank you so much for your words and what you are doing and uh, keep, keep doing, keep in touch, keep strong. Thank you. All right. Boris, would you please unmute and join? <clears throat> uh, good. Thank you. I should add that the common um, of traumatization of a people in Ukraine is a Soviet oppression. When it to tell about historical traumas was forbidden. It relates to victims of Holocaust and victims of Holocaust. The book of Robert Conquest, Harvest of Sorrow, which described this, this uh, terrible experience of a mass feeling by starvation was forbidden and people who distributed it were interrogated in KGB. Nearly the same about Holocaust. The Yevtushen, who wrote a poem about Badi Yar, yes, this poem with the line there is no monument in Badi Yar and it really uh, no more. I have in my collection a copy of document from KGB. They, it was about the attempt to open up a small meeting in the yard place. And it was a letter from KGB wow. to the Central Committee of Communist Party that we will prevent this. And this the same, the same about Holodomor. And I know personally a teacher of Ukrainian language who spent in special help 
support for seven years because of distribution uh, the, um, information about Holodomor. I know a man who has a whole book of Grossman, everything is flowing. And there is a chapter about Holodomor. Interrogated mm -hmm. for seven hours in KGB from the book. So this oppression of memory is mm -hmm. a part, very important part of traumatism. Mm -hmm. Then I am uh, very grateful to Hanna, who had a terrible experience and survived not only people with your uh, with them he was speaking but he yourself because the dialogues with the people who passed torches is a very painful um, experience i had about 25 person who survived you know, I'm as profound of a people like that. Actually, actually, I really, for me, start in uh, 2014 too. But I realized it is a real war and it will be continued. But it was no my personal experience. I had a different experience because I lived in Odessa, predominantly speaking city, and uh, actually, actually, Ukrainian language was popular in this city. And it was uh, maybe uh, related as a rural language. And uh, for me, because I started to support my dad, it was a very painful experience because it was a kind of rejection from my Russian students. Still, I speak sometimes Russian, sometimes Ukrainian, and it was another trauma. Trauma when your native language becomes the language of your enemy. It survived through that person. I could say it, it is not easy job thank you and i totally agree that the russians who are in ukraine now they are horrible. and i even can't relate to them as a people because of this brutal relation to us you know thank you Ah, so much wisdom, uh, which is part of what we learn from generations to generation, <laughs> and ought to respect. Uh, part of what you're reminding me in our work is in my own work with Nazi Holocaust survivors and their children and other and other genocide <clears throat> victims, that often the trauma is followed by silence. Sometimes it's politically driven, as you mentioned, right? Under certain regime, silence in fact is part of the trauma. And part of the task, I think, for Ukraine looking toward the future is to speak, to learn about all the unspoken silences in all of the related languages. So it won't be a burden of this conspiracy and secrecy that in fact, one of your poems, so so many of your poems speaks about. Actually, we are going to, as I mentioned, this is the first of a series of webinars in the 
we will have on Chernobyl on April 25. And uh, in November 26, we will have a, 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 another webinar on the multi-generational legacies of Holodomor. And in fact, we are planning to read one of your poems about the silence the silencing of a lot of more victims or even professional speaking about it. So I think that is a primary task that or is when you're speaking about uh, planning, uh, you know, public health, uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, so, so the media would have to be specialized, the, the teachers, the clergy, it won't just be the specialists who have an MD and PhD and, and, and social work after their names, right? I mean, the teachers have exposure to so many children. Uh, they have, they, and they're part of the same trauma. Which, which means they need to heal in order to help the children heal. Uh, so you're speaking about a comprehensive plan uh, and, and a huge task, but it's doable. It is doable if, if, if you plan it with the eye of what we've learned from history. Um, and, and, and indeed the center would be more than glad to share all the lessons we have learned from other, from other uh, post-war countries, uh, and uh, from uh, and the need to rebuild. And one of the reasons for the urgency of this is to tell the international community not only not to abandon Ukrainians during this horrible time, but also not to plan only for infrastructure, not to plan only to rebuild buildings, but to be absolutely committed to rebuild people, to heal individuals, families, communities, the whole society. So indeed, democracy will be possible. Genuine democracy will be possible. Uh, Hannah, I wondered if you wanted to add anything at this point before we open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, honestly speaking from one point, no, but from another point, I listen to you and it seems to me that everything you say is very correct, but what is missing, there's a listen, a little accent that the world is ongoing and we're working in it. We, it hasn't stopped. So it's not a post-war experience. We don't even know what the consequences indeed are going to be of the war because our children now study at schools while they're in bomb shelters. Every day we wait for bombings and we don't know what's gonna happen. And we work in this, we live in this, we develop, even now we're talking to you about this. And so, you know, when we speak of work with consequences, I wish the world to remember that now we're not about consequences. We're about today's reality. Now psychologists work not with consequences of trauma. They work with symptoms. We are working with the crisis. We're working in the war. We cannot work through trauma now because we're still in it. And it seems to me that we, that that's where the accent needs to be. And we need to keep that in mind. Thank you for, for, for the reminder of the presence. <laughs> and the urgency of the presence. Absolutely. Thank you. And I believe many of us, I know Irina, uh, Irina, would you like to share about your, your project about exactly that? Go ahead. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yael, for uh, organizing this excellent event. And thank you, dear colleagues, that you uh, agreed to participate and you joined. And uh, basically, Yael, anybody who we approached uh, immediately said, yes, we want to contribute. And this was a very promising that uh, this type of event is, is of high uh, demand. And um, uh, I was amused by uh, wisdom of uh, Boris Grigorievich uh, um, and, and, and the practical approach of Orest and very personal uh, experience of Hanna. And I want to point uh, one important thing is, is that we fight uh, for our mental health and especially for uh, mental health of our uh, future generations and of mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a difficult task while war is still ongoing. And I want to share with you one, 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 one example. I'm, I'm a group psychotherapist and uh, our group is ongoing and we haven't st stopped for even one week um, during this war. And today uh, the group was talking about uh, fear to bring children into this horrible world. Mm -hmm. And this is a well-known uh, sign of trauma. And yeah, mm -hmm. you, you know it very, very well. I learned it from you and from your experience. But I want to tell you that this is exactly what Russians want. They want to, they want to expose us to this, uh, to this fear and uh, hope that we will manage to resist. And many more Ukrainians will be born this year and in the upcoming years. Thank you. You're very welcome. Go ahead. I wonder if, uh, Oris, thank you. You you put in the chat the uh, uh, Anne Applebaum's. Uh, thank you, Lois, for putting Anne Applebaum's book on Holodomor. Thank you, Oris, for putting uh, the reference to the Holocaust book. Uh, excuse me, to the Harvard book. I'm sorry. <laughs> My mind is very much racing right now with Boris, we have to, we have to organize another webinar on the multi-generational you know, effects of the Holocaust in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm afraid you will have to keep working with us. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's, I believe it's absolutely um, and I had, thank you, Helena, for also rec recommending James Mace. Uh, do you have his contacts by any by any chance? If you do, please put it on the chat. Um, I, I'm wondering. There is a long um, chat from to Chenyuk. Alexander, uh, it, and I cannot understand because it's in Ukrainian. Uh, Irina, would you do us the favor of translating it so we can respond? Yes. Uh, yes, and, and Dr. Alexander is a dear colleague of mine from uh, city Arivne, which is in, in the central part of Ukraine and he's a um, uh, group analyst and psychotherapist and he's working in his own city with um, with families of uh, and loss uh, in those families due to war and he uh, was wondering whether um, you know, there are any uh, programs of uh, 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 of financial support exist. <laughs> or donor programs uh, to provide this this uh, service for those families for free, you know, so that his, his uh, time would be paid by uh, national or international programs. And uh, this uh, question was specifically uh, addressed to, to Oris. Yes, yes, and Oris just put his uh, email. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. 
Boris, would you like to answer, to attempt to answer this? This was to Oris. It was question for Sorry, me. Sorry, say that again. Irena, please. Dear Yael, this, was, this question was uh, addressed to Orest Suvalo. Oh, oh to, to Orest. Sorry, so sorry. Orest, please unmute yourself. Uh, I already answered it to him. Uh, uh, Thank uh, you. Oh, we can now, speak in, uh, please speak English. Orest. <laughs> mm. I already answered it to him. Okay. Oh. Orest, maybe you are in the Ukrainian <laughs> channel? No. Okay. I'm original audio. You need to choose the channel. I, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, oh thank you. So, Orest answered the question. Uh, Daniel uh, Chorney is saying with trauma people <laughs> often feel shame and stigma. Some of you have sp spoken of going silent today, not only uh, not only actually Boris spoke about oppression or memory, which is even more uh, eloquent, of course. Uh, in rebuilding the future mental health in Ukraine, are any of you optimistic that culture can change so that people, perhaps especially children, will be more willing to speak openly about mental health? Here in Canada, it has taken decades for people to speak more openly. But my worry is the culture in Ukraine is more stoic and reserved. I am a child psychologist in Canada, so work with this daily. Uh, uh, any one of you would like to respond? Hannah, how about you trying to respond? <laughs> Honestly speaking, Indeed, it, is, it scares me to speak about children. This is our category. These are people who were captured, their families, and what uh, families of those who gone missing. And what I see there, uh, when adults are going through trauma, the children become adults. The children start taking care of the mother who's left behind. And if it's a boy, that they take over the role of the father. And indeed, Way too often in traumatic events in Ukraine, I see that the adults are trying to solve problems of survival or um, breaking free, and the children, they are set aside, and the children are forced to be adults in the family, the family that is overcoming trauma. And I don't know what's going to happen later on with these children. I don't know what are the issues that these um children are going to turn to uh, psychotherapist with. But today I see that way too often children are, is the thing that strengthens the family and helps the, ch the adults who are in great suffering to hold on to. I'm not sure if my colleagues agree with me. I'm not, I don't know if they have similar observations. I want to add the important uh, uh, point about the ongoing war. So uh, we've learned that uh, many, many people, they uh, try to uh, stay resistant because they try to you know, fight and survive and uh, uh, minority can afford, um, you know, talking about trauma and crying about trauma today. May I also add directly to Hannah's question and the notion that what's important is to focus on the children. I'm totally in agreement, but part of what we have learned is that when parents say, I'm not, I don't matter, what matters are my children. 
leads to effects that don't help the, the parents or the children. So particularly the children who are not born yet. So please learn from our experience with Nazi Holocaust survivors and their children and with many others that while yes, the focus on the children is number one, before number one has to come the healing of the parents in the society where the children grow up. So please remember that. There's not, in, in this area, nothing is just simple, of course, because we are dealing with human beings, particularly in the middle of a mess and a chaos. But unhealed parts of the parents, whether consciously or not, might find their way to the children's lives. Not intentionally, So I, I don't mean to give a whole lecture in one sentence, but I do want to I do want to caution against simplistic simplistic um, or one dimensional uh, answers. Uh, so because, for example, if you give it a, a try right now. Uh, Right now, experience what you're saying. What matters is my children. Well, if you have a child who hears me say that, how do you feel? You might feel guilty. You might feel the burden. You might, you don't necessarily. In my writings, I found different adaptational styles and please learn from them and we have we also have an inventory to assess this. But it, it, please remember the, par the healing of the parents is an integral part of moving forward. Otherwise the children will bear the burden of unhealed parents. And the society will, and of course all the specialists and the non-specialists, which is very scary. It, so uh, it's a word of caution more than, uh, yeah, Sandra Rose, thank you for your comment, uh, it, it, it viewing that. Um, uh, again, we have, this is an ongoing conversation, of course, not only not only not only different webinars, but we, we will work together anyhow. But um, Irina is telling me we do have one question from Julia Richter. Uh, thank you, Julia. Julia is in Hungary, uh, worked with us on creating the inventory. So Julia is saying, thank you for this webinar. My organization in Budapest is working with refugees. Our experience is that it is a great resistance toward mental health help, except for children. <laughs> so they are the ones who carry the symptoms and through them, we can reach the parents. Oh gosh, Julia, thank you for the wisdom. Uh, uh, and that brings us back to the question that was asked before. Would, would Ukrainian culture be open or will it be willing to open the more direct um, approach to parents, not only to children, to children indirectly? So again, you're putting the children in a position to heal the parents. Okay, please just remember this conversation. There is so much to say. 
there is there was one more comment that I wanted to to report before we close, which breaks my heart that we close. Uh, from Florence Dreger, she Dreger, she writes the Florence Center in Japarizia provides some of this response regarding trauma-based needs. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Florence, and I'm sure there are others. Uh, or as to what you said before about needing to coordinate and to collaborate uh, is, is the task. Go ahead. Thank you very much. English, for, please. I'm, I'm speaking English. I'm trying oh. to speak loud. So you should to, to change the channel probably. And uh, for me, it's... Thank you very much for this for this discussion and for this opportunity to share our experience and what we are feeling doing and with what we are struggling now. Because as Hannah told, this is ongoing process. We are deep inside the traumatization and we have a lot of challenges for from many directions. So and to be honest, there is no always the answers to these needs. And why I like would like to see the good communication and cooperation between different st stakeholders to to try better to cope with with challenges and needs. And this is very difficult task. Mm -hmm. From this, everything is beginning, but the reality is quite other. And uh, I have to like maybe some summary for for this discussion just to keep going this and we need this we need to be heard in the world and also i think would be good if it's possible to make collection in your website probably about english language materials from ukraine and also to try to translate into english some memoirs on some books of witnesses from the 20th century because we have a lot of memories from Ukrainians, Jewish people survived in 20th century and wrote in English, in Ukrainian language, but it's not well known in the, in the world to understand that we have the deal with the same, with the same approach, with the same attitude toward, toward people, and it's already 100 years, and we world didn't make a, a summary for this. So we world didn't attempt some steps to prevent this. So, and uh, and okay. now I think that we should collect information, share information, given stage for Ukrainians, share our resilience, share our experience. And also if someone wants to help, we are open and open for collaboration. Thank you one more time. Well, thank you. And for the audience, the, uh, you will receive, the, those who registered would automatically receive the recording. Of course, each one of you will have the full recording. Uh, and um, as I said before, in this series, the next, the upcoming one, uh, webinar is April um, 25 on Chernobyl. Uh, November and next is November 26 on Holodomor, but I'm sure we will have some more in between. And of course, we have other, not only Ukraine focus, we have on the 15th of March, we have uh, a webinar planned on Aleppo. Uh, on on the 20, 31 of March, we have a webinar of artists, indigenous artists talking about the meaning of their art as resistance. Okay, and onward, of course, in April, we will have many others because we do have the Rwanda. April, you know, is genocide month. On the 7th, it's the anniversary of Rwanda. Then you have on the 17th, Cambodia. On the 24th, Armenia. At the end of the month is Holocaust. Uh, 
And so we have a lot of work. Uh, and of course, also in June, uh, Hannah, you'd want to know in June, we would have um, June 26 or, or 21, is it International Torture Day? We'll have a webinar on torture. So that would be very important for you to, to attend. I Please follow us at the center. We are active all the time. And as you see, we have extraordinary, extraordinary human beings working with us. I, I feel so profoundly humbled. Boris, would you please say some, no, we have the last part of the webinar is last words by each one of you. Uh, who will start? Boris, you will be last. Let's start with Hannah. <laughs> Hannah, what last words would you like to leave with the audience? And actually with the international community. Mm. I am very grateful for this webinar. This was significant. And honestly speaking, I indeed hold it important that so many people indeed joined and they're interested in the topic of Ukraine. So I'm grateful, um, Dr. Yael, that you organized this. And I would say your last word is we need you in the present. <laughs> Thank you. All rest, please. Thank you one more time, Dr. Yale and Dr. Irena Frankova, because what you are doing is a big resource for us to have one hour of time to reflect what's going on and to think about issues and also to show our situation here and uh, just to change, like exchange the opinions. And I, I wish you good luck and I'm open for cooperation and hope that a lot of good people from Ukraine will have possibility to present our experience. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Irina, would you like to have a last word here? Um, I will just uh, comment on the chat. I was looking through, through the Ukrainian and English comments and I see uh, a lot of appreciation and as well, that the topic on how psychotherapists, um, con well, the counter-transference of psychotherapists to, to, this, to this topic of multi-generational trauma is very important. <laughs> Hopefully we will have time to talk about this in our future <laughs> webinars. <laughs> we will have a whole webinar on that for sure. And many of them, absolutely. Boris, you have absolutely the last word. First of all, I want to say thank you to organize to which really very important for me pro project, which really let us possibility to speak out to a broad audience and share our thoughts. And uh, I want to say thank you to Marina, who very well how difficult was your job this day. And okay, I am open for collaboration. Our institute in Kiev has a program of support of people which have some groups who are working. And I personally is always open to consult people who pass through this terrible experience. And thank you, thank you everybody who was who was the thanks. Thank you. And we see you next time.